HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film. Powder donut. <clears throat> Okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The Name Your Price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of digital audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash business growth. I have been doing this podcast for a number of years, and besides being personally um, thrilled to be able to talk to all of the people I've been able to have conversations with. I am really honored that this podcast is continuing to gain recognition as a great resource for all of you, small business owners, sales professionals, business leaders. Folks are finding this podcast because of those guests, because of these folks who have expertise in certain areas of business and they join me for a conversation where they share that expertise with all of you. Today is no different. My guest today is Lena Renee. Lena is Vice President of Consulting for Franklin Covey, world leader in consulting and training individuals and organizations to achieve results that require lasting changes in human behavior. She oversees hiring, development, and management of Franklin Covey's world-class consultant team and spent six years as a Franklin Covey senior consultant focused on individual effectiveness and leadership development. She is a loyalty expert, one of my favorite topics, and the co-author of the book, Leading Loyalty, Cracking the Code to Customer Devotion. Thanks so much for joining me today, Lena. Thank you, Diane. It's such a pleasure to be here. 
I am so excited to have you here. We are going to be talking about this concept of loyalty, which in today's business environment is so different from what loyalty was, say, 20, 30 years ago, uh, that, that I think it is hugely important that we are going to be, you know, exploring it today. You bet. You bet. In fact, I think 20, 30 years ago, everyone was talking about customer satisfaction. <laughs> Let's just keep them satisfied, right? And that conversation certainly has shifted to realizing that satisfied customers are not the same thing as loyal customers. Yeah, exactly. That is exactly right. So will you explain the difference between true loyalty and loyalty of convenience or habit? Yes, you bet. And in fact, one of the really fun parts about research and writing this book was the opportunity that we had to talk with so many people, so many leaders, entrepreneurs about their own experiences in how they're building loyalty. And there is a really important distinction between the two things you just said, the true loyalty and the loyalty of convenience or habit. And the, that anchors, the difference anchors into how people feel when they interact with your organization or with you or with your frontline or your team. It, it's about emotion. In fact, when we ask people to share one of their best customer service experiences, and, and we've done this hundreds of times, of course, they'll pause and they'll think about it, and then their faces will just light up as they launch into this passionate diatribe about the time that they felt cared for or valued by an organization. So if we asked your listeners to do the same thing, and they would have the same reaction, right? Think of a great customer service experience you had and how you felt. So it really is about feeling. True loyalty is emotion-driven, and loyalty of convenience or habit is not. And that's a pretty important distinction for any organization to make. And it feels to me like this loyalty of convenience or habit is, is sort of um, – well, we know we need to be loyal, so yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Set up a system, right? No one believes in, but let's just do it. That's that way we right. Can yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. And you, that's where you see all of these kind of um, scripts. You know, when you call a customer service center and the script that they launch. You know, thank you for being a loyal customer. It's I don't want to say manipulative because that in, that implies ill intent, and there might not be ill intent, but they certainly aren't authentic. And I think some of it is this place, when you just said that, it, it made me think of an organization that I, a company, a major company, who shall remain nameless, who <laughs> I used to deal with, and their customer, the way you got to their customer loyalty department was you complained about something, and then they would patch you over there, and those people would say, well, you've been such a great customer for 16 years that here's what we can do for you. And I would just be left like scratching my head thinking, okay, what? You should be reaching yeah. out to me and saying, thank yeah. you for being such a loyal customer for 16 years. Yeah. Here's what we want to do for you. It's backwards. Yes. Yeah, and you think about how it made you feel when you got patched over. We're like, really? Like, the, the yeah. loyalty is built on, on feeling, right? And we like to think that we're rational human beings and, and that purchasing decisions are rational, but behavioral economics shows that's just not true, right? We, we purchase on emotion and we engage with others on emotion. And, and that's what I think organizations are missing when they try and create these artificial loyalty programs. Yeah, yeah, you have to really own it. So so what is the role that empathy plays in building loyalty? So I love that you asked this because as we were developing this content and all the research, we identified that there are really three principles that drive loyalty. There are a lot of behaviors, and we identify behaviors in the book as well, but there are three principles that drive loyalty. And if all your listeners did following this, if they just wrote down these three words, these three principles, and started to ask themselves, do I engage with my customer, whoever that customer is, because this could be internal or external, these same principles apply in any relationship. But if they just wrote down these three words and then ask themselves if they engage along those principles, it, I think it would have dramatically different results for them. And the first principle is empathy as you just mentioned. 
And we define empathy in a pretty standard way. We say that it's the ability to identify with and understand another person's situation or feeling. Right? So you're just, you're just trying, I mean, it's that whole walk a mile in their shoes, see it from their perspective. But what, what we know is that one of the deepest human needs is to feel understood, to feel heard, to feel validated. And all of those things come through empathy. And, you know, just back to what you said a moment ago, you know, empathy is not something that can be faked. By yeah. definition, if you're trying to fake a connection, it's not empathy. <laughs> So, so empathy is me seeing you as a human. We, our customers, again, internal or external, they're not robots. I mean, we, we are humans. So if I take the time to connect with my customers through empathy, that is where the feeling that drives true loyalty begins. Okay. That makes sense to me. What are the other two? So the first one is empathy. The second principle is responsibility. And when we define responsibility, we're just saying you're, you're doing what needs to be done. You're taking ownership of what should be done for your customer. And so once I can empathize and we are connected, and, and I might just add, you know, you can connect with another person at a glance, right? You, you, human connection doesn't mean I have to sit down and, and actually understand your entire life story or actually walk that mile in your shoes. We can connect in a moment. But then once we're connected, do I take ownership of seeing your needs through, right? This isn't passing you off to another department. Like this is, I, I, own, I own what you need from us or from the organization. And by doing that, I allow your stress levels to drop. If I can communicate to you, I'm going to take care of you. I'm taking ownership of this. And the opposite of responsibility is indifference, right? Yeah. So you can, you can feel the difference even in those two words, right? Responsibility versus indifference. So that's the second principle. Do we take responsibility for our customers' needs and outcomes? And then the third one is generosity. So it's empathy, responsibility, and generosity. And when we talk about generosity, we're saying that that is giving from the heart, right? This is giving more than is necessary or expected from our customers. And Again, this is about the human connection and about feeling. And you can't manipulate that. You can't fake it. So when I give from the heart, sometimes we'll have organizations flinch at this one and they'll say, well, you know, geez, how much is this going to cost our margin? <laughs> da, da, da. And, and look, we, we understand no margin, no mission. So we understand yeah. that margin is important and it doesn't take money to be generous. Yeah. I mean, Time is generous. Eye contact can be generous, right? I mean, this is just really giving more than might be expected in the moment. So it's, I'm so glad that you, you said this thing about, you know, how much is this going to cost me? Because when you started talking about generosity, it reminded me of when Duluth Trading opened one of those massive stores that they're opening all over the place. They opened one near me, and mm -hmm. I, I wanted to go get my husband something there for um, Christmas and I and the place was packed and yeah. they had registered like the square in the middle of the store with all these registers and they were all being manned by somebody but and there was still a line and this woman was walking up and down the line saying can I get you a glass of water or you know a, a oh. bottle of water can I get you a bottle of water and I just thought wow really and I noticed someone had a cup of coffee in their hand and I said I I'd love a cup of coffee she goes okay <laughs> she goes I mean back. Get what a perfect coffee. example. Exactly. Didn't, that doesn't cost them anything. They've got the water no. there. They've got yes. the coffee. Coffee doesn't cost anything. But, oh, my gosh. What a I, difference. Such a great experience that they yes. knew that waiting in line was sort of a pain, and they were trying to make it as enjoyable as they could. And, and just to what you're saying, you know, I think that sometimes when we look at the financials and we're worried about margin, it's that, you know, we're, we're saving pennies. Yeah. And we're missing the opportunity to make much more because loyalty, I mean, we talk about loyalty as feeling and about human connection, and it's the right way to do business. But there is no doubt that loyalty is profitable, period. 
right? I mean, right. loyal, yeah, I mean, deeply profitable, not a little profitable, deeply profitable. In fact, organizations that are known as loyalty leaders on average go twice as fast as those that are not. Because loyal customers, they're magic in some ways, right? They, they, they not only come back over and over again, they're shown to spend more per transaction. They are shown to be your greatest marketing and sales force, right? Because we want to talk about all these great experiences. And then they also do something that I believe is invaluable and loyal customers will provide you with feedback. When you mess up, a dissatisfied or a passively satisfied customer will just walk down the street. Right. They're, they're out your door. But a loyal customer will say to you, hey, I wasn't treated. I mean, and feedback is golden, right? So yeah. they'll give you feedback and they'll forgive you. Right, exactly. Well, and, and so is part of this loyalty really listening to the – is this one of the places where empathy comes in, yeah. where you really listen to the feedback and acknowledge it and do something about it? Yes, yes. In fact, I love the way you phrase that because it actually hits on two of our different principles. One is listening. Under empathy, we say there are two ways that you can behave with empathy. One is to make a connection, whether that's eye contact, whether that's your voice, even digitally you can make a connection. The second one is to listen. So under empathy, we make a connection and we listen. And you, you listen to understand them, right? So you, you pause and hold off on the defensiveness, hold off on why you need to show them that they're wrong and it wasn't really a mistake or whatever's coming to mind. You just understand them. And then the second principle that you touched on is responsibility because under responsibility, we follow up. So if something was done wrong, we we immediately engage in the appropriate service recovery to ensure that that customer feels good at the end of the day. So you just helped me realize the problem that I am having with an organization that I've been dealing with. <laughs> because I was really articulate about what yeah. my concerns were and got, you know, it was crickets as far oh, as the yeah. response. Yeah. And, yeah. and then met with them and, okay, I'll follow up. You didn't. And, and it just telegraphed oh, me that I don't matter, that they don't care, that it, this is just really, and, and it was a big issue. And even if it wasn't for them, it was for me. Yes. Right. Of course. I totally missed that, that and what they could have, done about it and unfortunately now how I feel about them. Yeah, and 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 you know that there's lots of research that shows that once you appropriately handle a complaint, like if you can do active service recovery in a way that makes your customer feel valued, you actually can create more loyalty than if nothing had happened. Right? So so when there's an upset customer, it, it's such an unfortunate missed opportunity when organizations don't realize, oh, in this moment, we can create a real partner in our customer. Like we can create intense loyalty with them, but boy, if you miss it, you really miss it. Right, right. It's like the damage that you do is as bad as the benefit that you can reap. Yeah. On the yeah. right, on the other side. It's, now, it's not so let, let's say they can't solve the problem. That it really is something that they they you know legally or whatever they they just are mm -hmm. not able mm -hmm. to do something about. Does it matter more how they handle it, or or yeah, I, they still need to give it the same amount of energy, or you know what do you think? Yeah, because to your point, I mean, you're not going to keep 100% of your customers satisfied every moment of every day, <laughs> right? I mean, that, that obviously, and yet, even if you cannot solve their problem, right? If your intent is there, look, we want this to be a win-win, we want everyone to come out feeling good, and yet, there is some block, a budgetary block, a legal block to your point, and we will not be able to meet this customer's needs. You might lose a customer. I mean, you will. You're going to lose a customer here and there. But there is a big difference between escalating it until that customer feels, you know, 
angry and dismissed and and shamed or whatever comes with that and then storming out and then a customer and I, and you will hear these stories as we've talked to people you hear these stories where they it wasn't a pleasant um, experience as such, but they, there's a respect. You know, they weren't able to solve the problem, but they really did everything they could. Or I had every time I engaged with them, it was pleasant, even though the outcome wasn't what I wanted. And so you can escalate or you can de-escalate in those situations, knowing that you may not, um, you may not always be able to meet their need. I'll tell you that what I believe the most important skill in those circumstances is, is around empathy, and it is that listening skill we talked about yeah you know the fact that the organization you referenced didn't even respond I mean there's no worse way to feel unheard that you literally do not feel heard but if I I may not be able to meet your need but if I can just empathize and listen to you um, that goes a really long way it really does and to your point you can't fake empathy you you can check all the boxes but if it's not authentic it it doesn't work yeah and you know it's so funny because I am um, I'm a pretty easily satisfied customer what you just said reminded me so I are at our airport here their parking short-term parking was full and I just called to tell them you know just a bit of feedback hey you know when you're running late for a flight this is really stressful and it was so interesting because when I called I got the customer service and I just wanted to give the feedback and (laughs) All I needed her to say back was, yeah, I understand. It's really stressful. Like, if that is all she would have said, I would have said, thank you. Just make a note of it. We would have hung up. But instead she said, I mean, she was just immediately defensive. And, and bless her heart, she probably had gotten a hundred other calls like this. And it's not the <laughs> highlight of her day either. But instead she said, well, we can't anticipate the flow. You know, there was a, and all of a sudden oh. where I had just been annoyed before, all of a sudden I was mad. <laughs> you know? <laughs> And yeah, so it, it is worse. Just, yes, it's just it's just people want to be heard. Yeah. So I do think even if you can't, I mean, the woman couldn't have solved it for me. Right. But it's a simple example of where, you know, just listen and, and, and validate that someone feels upset. That's really stressful. I understand that must be stress. I mean, any of those types of responses would allow, it allows the, the, the person talking to kind of just relax a little. Right. right? It takes my stress level down. Right, right, yeah. exactly, instead of increasing it. Right, oh. yes, and and you can see that in that small thing, it's not, every touch point that we have, every interaction that we have with a customer is an opportunity to build loyalty. Yeah, that's or so destroy important. It. Right, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It, yeah, people really need to hear that because, it's so easy to not think about it and not mm-hmm. realize either that you missed out on an opportunity or you made something that was easily dealt with. I won't even say solved, but dealt with uh, mm-hmm. worse instead of better. Yes, that's right. And and what I might just, as you're saying that, what um, also pops into my mind that I think all of, all of your listeners should maybe consider is that we keep using the word customer. But really, that could be any stakeholder that you have. I mean, I've worked with leaders of finance divisions within an organization. And these same principles of empathy, responsibility, and generosity are what are allowing their teams in finance to be seen as the most effective team in the organization because their, quote, customers are are those around them looking for data or for reports or information. So. I think we have to be careful when we define customer. This doesn't necessarily just mean the person giving you money. Your customer could be your leadership team. Your customer could be your boss. If you're a leader of people, your customers are your team members as well. And the same principles apply. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I think that is a huge point because sometimes there's a lot of organizations where the, the, customer is an internal customer that they're not ever dealing with anyone outside but they still need to to embrace these principles yeah wow that's right and it even applies outside of your professional lives as well I mean that that was one of the things that really stuck with me through this research is in your friendships are you exhibiting empathy are you generous I mean loyalty Uh it's like 
two steps beyond trust. It's not just that we trust each other, right? It's that I'm intensely loyal. I mean, there's a whole, again, it's back to that human emotion yeah. feeling part of it. And these same things apply whether we're talking about friendships or your sweetheart. I mean, this is human connection. Boy, no kidding. That's so interesting. Mm -hmm. It makes perfect sense when you say it. I just, you know, you get used to putting things in certain buckets. Yes, yes, yes. So something to think about anyways. Boy, no kidding. Okay, now now I, I have a question about the shrug. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm excited and, about. <laughs> yeah. The, the, Talk about the, the shrug. Symbol, right. Of, of indifference. So, please uh, expand yeah. on what the situation is with the shrug and what we're doing to what ourselves it means. with it. You yeah. bet. So, so when we talked about responsibility and indifference. We, we reference this kind of metaphorical or symbolic shrug that we see organizations doing. And it, the shrug is, I mean, if I were standing in front of you or looking at me and you asked, can I help you? And I shrugged at you, uh-huh. right? It's, it's this me conveying all kinds of things in that moment. Like, well, eh, I don't care or nothing I can do for you. Or it is that it is a solid symbol of indifference. And the example you gave just a few moments ago of you having submitted all of this effort and articulating your need and getting no response, Uh that was a giant shrug. Giant. (laughs) (laughs) And yes, and and we communicate indifference in ways we don't intend to even. I mean, I know that, so for example, we're all moving a million miles a minute. We all have inboxes full to the hilt. And yet we have to acknowledge that if you do not respond to your email in a timely way, you are shrugging at the people who are sending them to you. And, and it's painful to think about in a way, because I mean, just like you and all, all of your listeners, you know, the 200 emails sitting in my inbox haunt me in some ways. It's tough to get through them all. And yet we have to acknowledge that that is a shrug. And when people sit on the phone waiting for our customer service um, representatives to pick up, that's a shrug. Yeah. And it's a dangerous place to be if you're trying to build loyalty. Uh, yeah, boy. This so resonates with me. I've, I've been in two meetings in the past two days where w- the subject was when people go radio silent and they don't return your email or your phone call or anything, even if the answer is no. Yeah. And, and, all, and you think you had this great conversation with them and then all of a sudden they're, they're just not there. And we weren't talking about it from a loyalty standpoint, um, but, but, it, but I get it. It's that, relevant. That it, yeah. it, it is. It's, it's, they are yeah. indifferent to um, how they're responding to, to you and, and what your right. expectation is. Yeah. It's rude. You know, I met it. it it's, it's, it's rude. And it really does convey this your, like value. And, and it may not be the intent. I mean, when I take longer than I want to just reply to an email, of course, that's not my intent. Right. But we have to acknowledge that that's what hap- what's happening. I met uh, an HR executive just yesterday who was saying one of the things he and his team are committed to is ensuring that for every applicant into their organization, it's not a black hole. And he said, this is not a small thing. There is the effort behind this. But we know that there's a vulnerability every time someone's applying to your organization. And even if the answer is a straight out no, that is a better response than no response. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, yeah, wow. and, and and you think about an organization and someone in HR, you know, of course you're not hiring every person that applies, especially if you're a great place to work. But every person who's applying is also a potential customer. And if you're looking to build your brand as an organization and being a great place to work, every person, every touch point, back to that idea, every interaction and touch point is an opportunity to reinforce that you're a great organization to engage with. Yeah, that's a that that is such an important thing that people don't think about that these are potential yeah. customers. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I know we, yeah. we miss a lot of this. We don't necessarily connect the dots on these things. Right. And you know what I love about the book and, and all of the research and, and this whole process has been, you know, nothing that I'm saying right now is going to, you know, 
it's not rocket science. No one's going to be like, oh, my gosh, I should take responsibility for my <laughs> I mean, this is, <laughs> this is pretty straightforward stuff. And that's actually what I love about it, right? Because all we're saying is, you know, we don't always think through or just to your words, connect the dots. And this framework of the empathy, responsibility, and generosity is meant to help you connect some of those dots. It's not meant to make you think about human beings being human beings. I mean, this is all intuitive, and we don't do it. Right. So it's a way to get a framework for creating culture, whether you're a very small organization or a giant organization. Just getting people's minds connecting the dots on how we build loyalty and how we treat our customers. Definitely. Yeah, it, it's one of the, you know, common sense isn't so common. So, yeah. Right? Yeah. These are things that we should know. <laughs> and we probably do on some level, but we're, we're, we aren't really looking at are we applying these things. So that's, that's right. you know, what's so great about this book and the research is, boy, it, it really, uh, you know, boils it down to really basic uh, concepts that, like for me, I, I look at it and I think, okay, I get that. Th yeah. That I totally get. And I can connect that and I can understand why that matters to the subject of loyalty. And I think that's what's really valuable for small business owners or, you know, yeah. department leaders, whoever it is that is trying right. to make sure that they're leading in, in, a, in a good way. Right, because in our mind, you know, the easier it is to get, the easier it is to do something about yeah. about it, right? I mean, if it's easy to get, okay, we got it. Now let's do something. And that's ultimately what we're hoping at Franklin Covey as an organization, but also in this yeah. book, that people can actually take this and engage in tangible, specific behavior. Exactly, right. It doesn't feel so overwhelming. It feels like something. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to take a quick sponsor break, and then I have – some more questions for you. Yeah. Accelerate Your Business Growth Podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. They have over 150,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to them on any device, including whatever you're hearing us on right now. And if you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash business growth, you get one free audiobook and a one-month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are The Power of Positive Coaching by Lee Kalan and Leading Loyalty by our guest, Lena Renee. So visit audibletrial.com slash business growth, explore the books that are of interest to you, and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. Today we are in fact speaking with Lena Renee about the critical difference between habit and loyalty. So, we were before the break. We were talking about the shrug being like the yeah. international symbol for indifference. Can yep. you offer uh, some examples or some common ways that you know business owners, department leaders, whoever uh, are shrugging on the job and probably not even realizing that they're doing it? Yeah, you bet. We, we mentioned a couple of them. If you've got long hold times for your customers, if you're taking a long time to respond to email, um, Adam Grant just had a great article on this around the idea that, you know, you can't make the excuse, I'm just too busy to do email. We're all too busy and we all have email. And yet we are, you know, in my words, not his, we're shrugging with indifference when we don't address it. So those are some simple ones, but particularly for leaders, um, one of the shrugs I often see is canceling one-on-one -on -one meetings with team members. Oh. And I mean, that's, it's, boy, I'm telling you, we know, we know how busy everyone is. And yet I'll tell you when I, I report into our COO at Franklin Covey. And when I started reporting to her, um, I was just blown away in the entire time I've reported to her. She's never canceled a one-on-one. -on -one. Wow. And that woman probably has 40 meetings a week at least. And yet the, the, the message she, she sends to me when she always carves out time for me is it's huge. And, so, and, and she, that's, that's an example of generosity as well, Diane, right? I mean, it's yeah. generosity doesn't require money. It's generous of her 
And, uh, and so, so that's a big one is canceling one-on-ones or canceling meetings or even, you know, not, not taking responsibility of what's happening in a meeting and letting the meeting be meeting be ineffective is a way of communicating indifference. And so I think uh-huh. if we're leaders or business owners, it's really worth just saying, are there ways I'm communicating indifference to any of the stakeholders that we have, whether they're partners or vendors or customers or, or team members? Um, just that self-reflection would allow leaders to identify some of the shrugs they might be unintentionally, fully unintentionally engaging in. I so love that th- these examples. And so now I have a question uh, whether a certain circumstance you would consider a shrug. And that is when someone is performing about it and everybody knows it's going on and everybody knows nothing's being done about it. Would you say that wow. is a shrug? I absolutely would. And I love the example because we know that leaders create culture and yeah. culture is not only what you allow, but it is what you do not allow. And it's the boundaries you create. And by refusing to create boundaries, and, and this is tough, of course it's tough, yeah. but by refusing to create those boundaries of what we allow and what we don't allow, you communicate not only to that individual, but to, to your point, every person on that team is observing this. And it, it boy, you're setting the tone for just do what you want, indifference towards performance. And you know right. what else? Indifference to those two who are giving it their all. Yeah. Right? I mean, you're dismissing um, what they're doing as well. And you, wow, what a great example and really great example of indifference. It, it's unfortunately one of my favorites because I, I do a lot with leadership with people. And, and part of what usually comes up is that person who, is, um, oh shoot, I, I can't even think of the word that I'm looking for, but they, they, they really are um, almost instigators because they're not doing whatever. And I just look at the leader and say, okay, hang on a second. Mm-hmm. What system do you have in place to do something about that? Like that's right. on you, not on right. them. They're, it is poking the boundaries and you're letting the boundaries be jello. That's so, right. That's right. Yeah. And it really parents is too. bad for the, <laughs> right. Exactly. That's what I always <laughs> say. Adults are just bigger children, right? That's this is, right. You're supposed to do this for kids. You got to do it for grown ups. That's right. Oh, yeah. I, I never would have thought of it as indifference and a shrug, but I love this because. Boy, me too. Me too. Yeah. So thank you. Cause I hadn't framed it that way, but, but again, and, and it's, it's tragic when it happens because, yes. you know, we shy away from some of those tough conversations. And yet in that moment, we're creating culture and we're communicating what is acceptable and what we care about and, and what our priorities are and what our values are. And if we allow an underperformer to continually underperform, we do no favors to anyone, ourselves, the underperformer, and particularly not to all of the performers that are on our team as well. Right. And I think we really have to own that we are being indifferent to them and their needs and their best interests when we do this, because we get so focused, we, we think, oh, no one no one cares or no one realizes it. And, and that could be tremendously detrimental to a company because the good people are going to leave and you're going to be That's stuck exactly with all the bad right. ones. Yeah. That's exactly what happens. Yeah. Right. And in fact, when we look at how we define responsibility, the way we define it is it's taking yeah. ownership of what should be done. Yeah. And boy, right. we know what should be done in those circumstances. Exactly. Not always the easiest thing. I know, I know. But when <laughs> Leadership's guy, not easy. <laughs> you got to do it. Right. You're the you grown up. I want to switch a little bit over to social media uh, because mm-hmm. there's so much that is talked about, it, about social media, but also about following and, and loyalty and ambassadors and, and that kind of thing. So, how would you say a company can use their following to build loyalty, real loyalty? 
I think it's such an insightful question and an insightful application of our work because, you know, in a digital world with digital connection, and this is true whether we're thinking of a Fortune 10 company using social media or the solo entrepreneur whose primary means of connecting with their customers is their social media. In either case, in a world of digital connection, the principles and behaviors that we're talking about become increasingly important and relevant, if you ask me. In fact, there's this kind of upsurge in the conversation of humanity because it, it has over the last 20 years, and, and you know, I'm, I don't want to beat this topic to death because I know that the conversation's happening all around there, but it's easier and easier to disconnect from the humanity of it. Yeah. And so this kind of resurgence in the conversation of humanity, the empathy, responsibility, and generosity, and, and the connection that we make and the way people feel when they engage with us is more relevant than ever. ever. And if you're connecting with your customers or followers um, in social media, you can still do small things that communicate empathy, responsibility, and generosity. And, and, and when you mentioned social media, what popped right into mind for me is, you know, say I'm a solo entrepreneur with a lot of followers on my social media accounts. Yeah. Do I connect with them? Do I have a genuine connection? But my, that's two-way, right? Do, do I understand? Do I take responsibility? One of the things we talk about in responsibility is, um, you know, helping accomplish what we call the job to be done. In other words, our customers come to us because we meet some need of theirs. But do we really know what that need is, right? And that's part of ownership is I'm not just putting out there whatever I want to put out there. I am helping my customers achieve their job to be done, their end in mind. And I think for most people on social media, they may not have even framed it up that way. Why are people following me? And what are they hoping to get from me? Right. What makes me unique in their life? How can I help them accomplish their own great ends in mind? And so um, the responsibility, taking ownership, and then, of course, the generosity. And, and through social media, the generosity, you can build loyalty one follower at a time, right? You might communicate with one of your followers and say, hey, you know, gr great to connect with you. Thanks for being part of my team. Let me know if you see anything, you know, if there's anything you'd like to see on my social media. I mean, imagine if one of the people that you followed just pinged you with that simple message, yeah. right? And how that would feel um, to engage with that thought leader or with that business. So, I, again, I just think all of this is applicable in a digital world, albeit perhaps a little bit creatively. But it's those same three principles of empathy, responsibility, and generosity. What do, what do you think, Diane? Does that resonate? Boy, it really does. It really does. I and I, uh, as you were talking about it, I was like putting my own social media um, activity in there, and realizing that the one thing that I hear a lot is that we really need to be engaging with people. You know, asking mm -hmm. them questions. Mm -hmm. getting them to respond so we know where they're coming from and so we're showing that we really truly are interested in them we're not just throwing information out there and we're not right. surrounding everything it's like everything that we share isn't about us it's really about yeah. them and, and yes. helping them be better yeah yeah and it reminds me of Seth Godin um, I think it's Seth Godin who talks about you you know you're not going to be everything for everyone and if that's what you think you, you've got a long road ahead of you. So understand yeah. who are your people, right? Who are the ones that are right. coming to you? Who are you connecting with? And then make sure that you are doing everything you can for them. And, and then kind of leave the rest outside of it because you're not everything to everyone. So it's really understanding who, who is this group that's following me? Why are they following me? What, what can I do to help them connect with them, exceed their expectations? And that's where you build loyalty. And that's where, if you have a social media following, I mean, the loyalty behaviors are incredibly yeah. important because it's all about referrals. So they're tagging all of their friends and people that might be interested on your account so that now your following becomes that much more strong. And as you were talking about that, I think another place this applies is in the sales process. 
because yes. you're not going to sell to everybody and you do need to ask questions. You do need to do discovery and really understand where somebody is coming from and validate where they are and take ownership of, am I really the best resource for yes. that person or company? That's Can I exactly really it. help them or not? Yeah. I mean, this is fascinating to me. It's just and, and every aspect. It does. And just to what you're saying, any successful organization that has over the long term maintained success has done exactly what you just said. They understand what is this customer coming to me for and can I meet that need? And there are times you'll see organizations that will say, we're just not the best partner for you. And there might be a revenue hit in the moment with that conversation, but the partnership you create over time is vastly more valuable. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Right. And you keep yourself from getting into relationships that you shouldn't be in. Yes. That aren't going to be. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's so great. Okay. So speaking of satisfaction, um, <laughs> explain what the satisfaction metric pitfall is yeah. and how we avoid it. If you would, please. Yeah, so, so many organizations are looking to measure how their customers feel about them, right? So we all see it. How many surveys do we get in our inbox or how many calls? You know, how did you feel? Can I? And the challenge is sometimes we're measuring the wrong thing. So um, a recent metric that I've seen is measuring the number of touch points that a customer has. And Touch points inherently have no value. You have the opportunity at every touch point to create loyalty, but you also have the opportunity to miss creating loyalty in that touch point. So the number of touch points isn't the point. Um, the quality of the touch points is how people feel about you when they engage with you is where loyalty is built, kind of looping this back right to where we yeah. started the conversation. Yeah. And so Metrics are important, and I'm not indicating that data is not important because there's all kinds of great data you need to make strategic decisions as an organization. But ensuring that we're measuring the right thing, and you know, Fred Reich held when he kind of launched this entire field of customer loyalty about a decade ago with his book, The Ultimate Question. Um, you know, the, the one metric of loyalty is that question. You know, how likely are you to recommend this product or service to a friend or a colleague? Right, because that gets to how you're feeling. So that's a common one that it, we okay. see on surveys, and that's why. Because they want to see how do you feel about this organization. That's interesting. Now, that's okay. Um, would you say, <laughs> I've got another shrug to, to ask you about because when you said that, it reminded me of a two-question survey. So it was two questions. So, yay, it's short. No, okay. and, and the questions were, um, how likely are you to refer us to a friend or, yeah. or you know, family member? Um, I can't even remember what the other one was. But when you, you shouldn't ask that question, in my opinion, unless if you get something below, say, five on a scale of one to ten, there's a follow-up question, yes. which is, can you explain your rating and can yep. we reach out to you to discuss? Because That second part of what you said is uh, incredible. Can we reach out to discuss? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, because what you're saying, and in fact, Fred Reichelt says anything six or under is considered a uh -huh. danger zone, right? This is the detractor. And the point is, if you're a detractor, there's a unique opportunity to switch you over to the highly loyal customer because it's how you feel. You feel unsatisfied. If we manage it well, you will feel very loyal. But if there's no follow-up to yeah. someone who gives you that answer, then why are you asking? Right. Right. <laughs> now you just know people don't like you. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yep. And I actually yep. took that survey, and I thought, okay, wait. There's no place here for me to – you thank me for taking it, but you didn't reach back out to go, whoa, wait, because I gave him like a two, I think a one yes. and a zero, and heard nothing, and I'm thinking, okay, well, you're making a mistake if you think that I'm just being sort of, you know, cranky, because I have specific, I, I don't, I wouldn't have answered it if mm -hmm. I didn't really, 
Yeah, it's just like a total. And then I feel worse. Total mess. And yeah. then you feel worse. Isn't yeah. that interesting? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what a miss, right? And in fact, oh. the survey questions out of the ultimate quest in that book are, you know, how likely you recommend is the first one. And then the second question should be, why did you answer that way? Uh-huh. So, so it was a miss in terms of the oh. methodology that Fred Reich Health puts out there as well. But yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. and, and just to your point, the fact that afterwards you don't feel any better is yeah. just such a testament to what a miss it was on that organization's part. Exactly. Exactly. Believe me, they telegraphed loud and clear that they didn't care. Yeah. It, it would have been yeah. better if they'd never put, sent the survey. Just didn't ask. Yeah. 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 <laughs> True. They, they would have been at a higher, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, and I want to ask you about like points and reward programs because mm-hmm. everybody does them. Mm-hmm. Are they really beneficial in building true loyalty? Do you think? So I, I agree, right? Everyone seems to have their loyalty rewards. Yeah. And um, if we're talking about true loyalty, what we're saying is it's how people feel about you. So it's based on emotion. So if every time I have to pull out my card, I feel aggravated that I'm being forced to pull out a card, yeah. then I'm, I'm not, there's not true loyalty happening there, right? Yeah. <laughs> on the other hand, I can think of organizations that I am loyal to some, um, some, you know, travel organizations, airlines, hotels, and their points, it's not the point, it's how I'm treated with the point system, yeah. right? So it's how I feel, you know, and I'm sure that a psychologist could dissect all of the status component of this and, and what that means, but it's, you know, is it easy to use the points when I want a free night at the hotel? Am I treated with respect with the fact that, yes, I do fly a million miles a year with your airline, and because of that, I'm being recognized. So it is not the points that matter. And it's, it's how someone feels when they engage with you around that point system. And I think that's what we're often missing. Just giving points has no inherent value. And in fact, I think, again, if I'm irritated or aggravated every time you ask for my loyalty card and I have to dig through my wallet, then it's not doing you any favors at all to have a loyalty point system. So how do people yeah. feel around that is, I think, the more relevant question. I, I do too. And, and when you were talking about the hotel and the, and the airline thing, I started thinking about the hotels that I am, am a member, so to speak. And so I'm, mm-hmm. I'm gaining points, I'm sure. And I don't travel that much. However, I am treated so well mm-hmm. in those organizations and, and I'm not a, a huge user, right? So it's not that they're right. doing it because I'm spending a lot of money with them that keeps me coming back and, and right. makes me want to continue to be a member because uh, it's an enjoyable experience. So, yeah, I, I'm really getting this. It's how, they, how you feel when you're interacting with them. I, I get and it that. Could be, and it's so simple, too, right? If you're checking in at a hotel desk and it's a simple, you know, eye contact, thanks for being a member with us in a sincere voice, not a script. Yeah. Right? Something that simple. Yeah. Can, can be really profound in making me feel, again, the deepest human need to feel understood, to be, feel validated, to feel part of the tribe here, right? And so uh, it can be very simple to convey that in just a small amount of time. And I think that's one of the biggest points is that, that it's, it's not about money. It, yeah. It's about how it makes you feel. It's about okay. that connectivity and feeling appreciated and valued. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, and I would say, you know, for, for your listeners, if there was, if there was what kind of one big takeaway or one big action item out of this conversation that I would encourage, it would be to block aside an hour this week in your busy week and just think through those three principles, yeah. empathy, responsibility, generosity. And just begin to think, brainstorm, how, how are we doing in these areas and what might we be doing differently? And, and again, this could be through, through the lens of I'm a leader and how do I show empathy to my team members or I oversee our finance division and how do I show empathy to our executive team? Right? So, but, but sit down and evaluate it. And then I guess the second part B of this homework assignment is that you open the dialogue to those around you. Now, you, again, you might be a solo entrepreneur and there's no one you need to dialogue with, but you might go out to your followers or right. to your customers. 
But if you lead a team of people, what we encourage, and in fact, we have this structure in the book as well, is that you lead a series of huddles with your team. You create a weekly cadence of a 15-minute conversation about what are we doing to create loyalty in our customers. And you engage them in that process as well. And, and the book leads you through those huddles, although, again, it could just be as simple as opening the dialogue every week. Beginning of our meeting, hey, I want to launch in. Again, we want to make sure we're meeting our customers' needs and that we're building loyalty with them. What experiences have you had this week around that? Um, what could we be doing differently? Right? So, so that you, yeah. this is all about behavior change, Diane. So it's really what yeah. are we doing differently based on the conversation? So that's what I would say the big kind of takeaway action items might be. That is great. I so appreciate this conversation. And will you tell the listeners you know, how they can find you, how they can get the book, everything that, that they need to yeah. know, please. You bet, you bet. So you can find me on Twitter and on LinkedIn. It's L-E-E-N-A-R-I-N-N-E, Selena Renee. Um, and the book is available next month on Amazon and all your retailers. And, yeah, I just look forward to connecting. Anyone who wants to pick up the conversation, I'll look forward to hearing from them. It's so great. And I highly recommend the book. And, uh, consistent listeners of this podcast. Now, I, I don't necessarily say that about everything, but gosh, for the folks out there who are leaders in some fashion that, that you know, where you've got stakeholders, customers, employees, whatever it is, there is such incredible value in this conversation. And you, I mean, then you can tell in, in what you're going to get from the book. And I love this exercise of uh, these huddle meetings and just stopping and thinking about those three principles. So, Lena, thank you so much for sharing thank you. with my audience. I, I really appreciate it. And guys, listeners, hey, you know, you're the reason we're doing this. So thank you for tuning in. And if there this has sparked something for you or there's a topic that you would like us to cover, please reach out, let me know. Uh, and I want to thank our sponsor, uh, to get your free trial of audible.com as well as a free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash business growth to sign up. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film, P -p 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 Powder Donut. <clears throat> okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the name your price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The name your price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxwain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film, P -p 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 Powder Donut. <clears throat> okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the name your price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The name your price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Do you love news about LinkedIn, Indeed, Google, and just about every other recruitment tech company out there? Hell yeah. I'm Chad. I'm Cheese. We're the Chad and Cheese Podcast. All the latest recruiting news and insights are on our show. Dripping in snark and attitude. Subscribe today wherever you listen to your podcasts. We, we out. out.